بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Just a quick disclaimer before we begin. We usually blur pictures of immodesty on Muslim skeptic, but in order to show the depth of misguidance from the likes of some so-called leaders, we are not going to blur key moments of the video footage. Our brother Sajid Lipham, graduate of Islamic University of Medina, recently brought to our attention the ICNA mass convention that happened last month. One of the headline speakers at this convention was none other than Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. What Brother Sajid points out in his video is that this year we saw a lot of hijabi images being used for the pro qaum Lut agenda. Diversity and pride posters are including more and more images of hijabis, sometimes as lesbians, for example. In one case, the Muslim community was so outraged by the depiction of lesbian hijabis on a pride poster that they started a petition that gathered thousands of signatures, which forced the posters to be taken down. In other places, like the UK in previous years, mass Muslim protest has successfully blocked Qaum Lut material from being included in grade school curricula. So Sajid asks the million dollar question. Why are Muslims being featured in this pro-LGBT marketing when Islam and the Muslim community are so clearly opposed to this lifestyle? Would pork companies deliberately target Muslims for their pork products? Would alcohol companies deliberately target Muslims for their liquor products? Obviously not. So what has given people the impression that Muslims are good targets for pro-LGBT marketing? Why would anyone think that Islam approves of this? Brother Sajid makes the point that a huge part of the blame goes to organizations like Ikna Mass. They are the ones rolling out the red carpet for the likes of Ilhan Omar and praising her and presenting her as a role model for Muslims. Ikna Mass's leadership do this despite knowing about all the pro-LGBT and anti-Islamic views Ilhan Omar has. But decision makers at Ikna Mass simply don't care. They know that Ilhan introduced anti-Sharia legislation in Congress which called the Sharia barbaric and draconian. They know that she introduced sanctions on a Muslim country for implementing the Sharia. They know that Ilhan has voted for unconditional military aid to Israel and worked with pro-Zionist lobbying groups like AIPAC to further Israeli interests in Washington against our Palestinian brothers and sisters. They know that Ilhan actually condemned our Palestinian brothers and sisters for not being pro-LGBT enough. They know that Ilhan has danced in gay pride parades and unapologetically attended drag queen parties and celebrated LGBT over and over again. Ikna Mass knows all of this, yet they have nothing but the highest praise for her and feature her at their events over and over again. This is someone who have made us all proud. This sister of Islam, this American Muslim woman made all us proud. She followed the guidelines of Islam, Waqala innani muslimin, that she stood up for her faith. We will continue to support you and we, uh, sister, for you. Here is Ilhan speaking at the 2022 ICNA convention with her turban hijab, obviously not bothering to wear actual hijab for a Muslim convention. And if you are not, as the saying goes, many politicians use this, if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. Whether you are on a bus with someone, whether you are at the counter to rent a car, whether you are at the grocery store, whether you are running for office or already are in office, remember that you are an ambassador of our community, that you are an ambassador of our faith, and you are an ambassador of the culture 
that we want people to inherit. Notice how Ilhan says that if you're a Muslim politician, you're an ambassador of community, ambassador of Islam, and ambassador of the culture you want people to inherit. This is significant because many of those Muslim orgs that platform Ilhan Omar claim that she's only a politician and Muslims are not going to take their understanding of Islam from her. But Ilhan herself contradicts this idea. She thinks of herself as representative, not only of the Muslim community, but also of Islam in its entirety. This is extremely significant given the kufr that Ilhan Omar spews day in and day out. I mean, do these organizations like Ikna and all these complicit imams and du'at, do they not fear Allah? It's hard to expect much from sellouts, unfortunately. Just a couple of years ago, Ikna's convention had a talk about, quote, preserving faith in times of hardship. Who do you think the speaker was for this talk? Who could talk about preserving faith in times of hardship? You would think it was a Muslim, right? Wrong. They had a liberalized cultural Christian as the speaker, a guy that's not Muslim and who barely even counts as a Christian, more like a perennialist. Yet Ikna had this disbeliever lecture Muslims about preserving Iman. At this year's convention, Ikna brought another Christian to teach his religion to Muslims, Pastor Bob Roberts. For those of you who follow my Telegram channel, you know a little bit about Bob Roberts. He is a liberal Christian who is a fellow at the World Economic Forum. He works closely with compassionate Imams like Omar Soleiman, Yasser Qadi, Hamza Yusuf, and Muhammad Majid. His whole purpose is to soften Muslims up to the Abrahamic religion kufr agenda. Here is what he said at Ikna. Now here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Did you know that it's not easy to be a Christian in some places in the world like Pakistan? And so when I go there, do you know what the Pakistani Muslims do? Because of what I do in America with Muslims and standing up for your rights and your religious freedom, they try to do the same thing around the world. This is the whole point of Robert's agenda. He wants to promote secularism around the world under the moniker of religious freedom. The goal is to get the Muslim world to secularize and liberalize in order to get rid of the Sharia, get rid of al-wala wal-bara, get rid of this idea that only Islam is acceptable to Allah. This is, of course, exactly the purpose of the Abrahamic religion project that our own Mufti Abdullah Mullah has covered for MuslimSkeptic.com over the past year. Once the Muslim world secularizes, it will be much more compliant with Western liberal interests and less of a threat to the global liberal hegemonic order. This is the whole message of Bob Roberts, but packaged in a feel-good way to dupe naive Muslims. These are the kinds of shayateen that ikna and compassionate imams in general unleash on the Muslim community. There's nothing in Christianity that says that I can't love a Muslim as much as I love a Christian. And I love him. We hang out together. We laugh. We, we travel the world together. We've got to love one another. We really do. I mean, you know it. It's in the Quran. Love God. Love your neighbor. You know what my New Testament says? My New Testament says that we should even love our enemies. Now, when Jesus said that, he was very intuitive because you cannot love someone and be their enemy. The most radical thing that you can do is to love somebody, especially somebody that would do you harm. Now, that may sound crazy to you, but this is what God calls us to do because that's what changes the world and that's what we must do together. Amen? When Robert says he loves his Muslim friend Imam Majid as much as he loves a Christian, the idea is for Muslims to also think it's okay for them to love Christians as much as they love Muslims. This is, of course, contrary to Islam and al-wala wal-bara. We could do a whole analysis of how Robert's nonsense is aimed at Muslims in order to destroy Islamic values, to spread this idea of universal salvation, Abrahamic religion, and ultimately liberalize the Muslim community. 
But my point here is, when you see Muslims committing kufr by praying that their favorite dead non-Muslim celebrities or, for example, that Christian journalist Shireen Abu Akla, when they pray that these non-Muslims are in Jannat al-Firdaus, it is because of constant liberal conditioning and these kumbaya sessions at their Muslim conventions and elsewhere. But anyway, let's get back to Ilhan at Ikna. What's funny is that after Sajid released his video about Ilhan, Ikna quickly released a clip of the Ikna president saying that Muslims have to stand against immorality. When people come and try to tell us to justify LGBT issues, when people come and tell us to justify immoral actions, ICNA is your organization which tells you no to immorality. So ICNA and their defenders will point to this 10 second clip and claim, see, this exonerates us. See, just because we have the biggest promoter of LGBT speak at our event doesn't mean we agree with her. Did they learn this trick from Yaqeen Institute? How stupid does Ikna think we are? You think if you put a little disclaimer or you gesture toward the right thing that that erases the huge crime you have committed in the sight of Allah by promoting this fasiqa as a Muslim leader? Who do you think you're fooling with these cheap PR tactics? This is how the same Ikna president lavishly praises Ilhan. So this is a very special occasion, brothers and sisters. I'm very honored and humbled to introduce somebody very special to all of you. And there's not much to say in introduction as you all have been waiting for a very special person. A sister who stood as a sign of bravery. The only introduction she has as she is one brave Muslim woman. Sister who made the hijab a pride in American Congress. Made the hijab a pride in American Congress? What hijab is he talking about here? Turban hijabs? For those at Ikna who might not be aware, a turban hijab doesn't exactly meet the requirements of hijab. And what pride? Does he mean pride parade? Now someone might argue, well, Ikna just brings Ilhan to speak, but that doesn't change the fact that Ikna as an organization is committed to Islamic values. Well, are we sure about that? Consider this Ikna employee. This queer Muslim woman is a family counselor working for Ikna. In an article for the LA Times, Dina says that she stopped wearing hijab because it made her feel distant from her non-Muslim relatives. Hi everyone, my name is Dina Badawi, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm an associate marriage and family therapist with Ikna Relief. So we can see why Ikna considers her to be an ideal employee, right? It's also great that Dina is running an Ikna program specifically targeting girls and quote, women identified folks. What are women identified folks, I wonder? Can you think of a better role model for our Muslim youth than this Muslim queer woman? I wonder, is Ikna Relief using zakat money to fund their queer family counseling? Well, their website says that they use zakat for all six of their programs, one of which includes their Muslim family services. So it seems that yes, Ikna is using your zakat money for LGBTQIA+, affirming family counseling, and they are specifically targeting Muslim young women. So basically we can see clearly what ICNA is all about. Muslims should know what these organizations that claim to represent Islam and take millions of dollars in donations are really doing because I'm sure that a large percentage of Muslims who donate to ICNA or go to their conferences are not aware of these facts and if they knew they might stop supporting such an organization. But what about the so-called scholars and imams that ICNA featured at this convention with Ilhan and other deviants? 
Why do they continue to legitimize these deep violations of the deen? People like Yasser Qadi or Abdul Nasser Jangda of Qalam Institute. Or how about Omar Soleiman? In fact, Ilhan's speech at the convention was immediately preceded by a lecture from Abdul Nasser Jangda. Why do you think that is? Why do you think Ikna deliberately surrounds deviants like Ilhan with imams with beards and kufis? What message do you think they're sending to the community? Sadly, these figures have absolutely no problem, no shame attending events alongside Ilhan. They have no problem legitimizing her with their presence. They simply don't care. Furthermore, they have nothing to say against Ilhan Omar, whether at the convention or afterwards. In fact, Yasser Qadi and Omar Soleiman have had nothing but praise for their shiro Ilhan Omar. When Ilhan was elected to Congress, Soleiman was the first to celebrate on national news. Ilhan has even been featured on Yaqeen Institute as an African-American hero. For years, Omar Soleiman and Yasser Qadi have urged the Muslim community to take Ilhan Omar as a brave role model who, according to them, does so much good for our community. Why else would they have a long track record of promoting her and appearing alongside her at event after event? I would go so far, actually, as to argue that the prominence and notoriety that Ilhan Omar, Linda Sarsour, and other liberal politicians and activists enjoy in the masjid-going conservative Muslim community is solely because of figures like Yasser Qadi and Omar Soleiman. They campaign for these figures, open doors for them, basically push them onto a community that would have rejected them in a heartbeat all else considered. So the blame lies squarely on these compassionate Imams. Take Yasser Qadi for example. He has openly said that it was his ijtihad and the ijtihad of so-called mainstream du'at in America that Ilhan and other liberal politicians and activists bring so much khair and goodness to the ummah. And all that khair and goodness outweighs anything we might disagree with. Look, as long as a person wants to benefit the ummah as a civilization, right? I can't take that person as an enemy even if I disagree with specific issues that they mm -hmm. have. There are politics issues, have. issues, important issues. Yeah, but I'll, I'll disagree theologically and yes, morally, yes. but I won't cut off and yes. take that person as an enemy when they are in the long run in some way, directly or indirectly benefiting the ummah. We have... We might ask Dr. Qadi, what is this direct or indirect benefit that Ilhan Omar and her ilk have brought to the ummah? All the kufr, all the blasphemy, all the misguidance, are these... The benefits, Dr. Qadi? Uh, the only muhajjid in our Congress, Umar. Ilhan Umar, right? I strongly disagree yes. with many of her stances on transgender and LGBT. Strongly disagree, right? Yes. But in the end of the day, her presence in that auditorium and hall is a huge, huge blessing for us as a community. Right? And it comes at a significant cost of our, I mean, it comes with a significant yani, benefit of our political presence, right? But can I ask? Uh, let yeah, me, uh, yeah. She's also taken on the Uyghur cause. She's yeah. also supported, you know, uh, Turkey and some of issues that, that they've done. Mm -hmm. She's also the first person to publicly bring in the issue of, of the APAC lobby, yeah. which has opened the doors. No politician before her has been as blunt. And after she came, it opened a whole door. Now, mm. a lot of khair has come. Agreed. Now, yeah. in my humble opinion, yeah. and I'm not supporting what she's done, yeah. she couldn't have done that khair without that evil that is also but there. So he states that there are huge, huge blessings the Ummah has received because of Ilhan Omar. He lists three things. One, she has spoken out about the Uyghur issue. Well, so has every other establishment figure in Washington. People might not realize this, but opposing the Chinese Communist Party and emphasizing human rights abuses by the Chinese is US policy. Even Donald Trump himself, as president, denounced China and accused them of committing genocide against the Uyghurs. This is for political reasons, of course, not out of the goodness of his heart. But the point is, in Washington, it is not some brave, unique, or outspoken thing for Ilhan to speak about the Uyghurs. 
So that's one. The second benefit is she did something involving Turkey. Qadi doesn't seem to be sure himself what that something is. The third benefit he lists, she was the first politician to speak bluntly about APAC and the Israeli lobby. This is, of course, nonsense. There is a long history of non-Muslim politicians in the U.S. who have clashed with AIPAC and spoken out against Israeli influence. Just to mention a few of the most prominent ones, there's Dennis Kucinich, who was a prominent longtime serving congressman who also was a presidential candidate in 2004 and 2008. There is Ron Paul, another longtime serving congressman and presidential candidate, consistently voted against Israel and criticized AIPAC way before Ilhan Omar Omar was in politics. And then there's Bernie Sanders, a senator, presidential candidate, has opposed AIPAC many times in his career, openly called their annual conventions a platform of bigotry, and much more. Of course, none of these politicians have been 100% pro-Palestinian, but guess what? Neither has Ilhan Omar. In the most recent example, Ilhan voted for unconditional military aid to Israel. And in 2019, she signed on to an APAC letter in support of sanctioning Iran for the benefit of Israel. So Yasser Qadi's argument that Ilhan is providing some enormous, unmatched benefit to the Ummah, where is any evidence of that? Let's get to reality. She's there. Hmm. Are we benefiting or not? Yes, we are. Hmm. You see what I'm saying here? So next time she runs for office, should the Muslim community boycott her? Should the Muslim community vote for the non-Muslim guy yeah. just because she has a view that is really wrong, but yeah. she's done all of this good for the Muslim? But then that's uh, the question. The, the question is because now it could because we have to look at things from a Dawi perspective as well. If she's kind of muddying the waters and making it seem as if Islam is something which is not—that's her muddying. I'm very clear, and anybody can watch my videos. Yeah, I'm very clear, and I can say publicly yeah. I don't support her in these issues. Hmm. Has Yasser Qadi really been clear on these issues of LGBT? Let's investigate that for a minute because it's important. He claims he has been very clear. He says anyone can watch his videos. So let's watch his videos. So yes, Qadi has said that gay sex is haram. Congratulations, no one is doubting that. But when has YQ ever told Muslims to stand against the continuous expansion of Qawm Lut writes, when has he ever told Muslims to oppose this Fahisha normalization agenda? In reality, YQ has been instrumental along with Yaqeen Institute, Omar Suleiman, and Jonathan Brown in telling Muslims that they should either advocate for Qawm Lut rights or just sit back and let it happen because there are so many benefits for the Muslim community. Let's take a trip down memory lane, shall we? I would say I'm one of the very few clerics that have very publicly said that people who have whatever personal issues that they have, whether it's same sex, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, it's not our right mm -hmm. to judge them. They are welcome in our communities. You, would you tell them not to come to the masjid? You'd be happy. You're coming comparing to the a gay Muslim to no, a No, I'm comparing a sin to a sin. I'm not comparing the person but to the person. But it's a sin in your view. If a gay Muslim comes to see you and says, I'm well, struggling with well, my sexuality. If a, if a is person's he, well, having an affair, it's a sin. If a person's having a premarital intercourse, it's a sin. The theology of Islam is not going to change. Same-sex unions are an immoral issue. Whether the political freedom is given to them or not, I actually agree with Linda here, is that I understand the American government should not be in the job of policing morality. So Yasser Qadi here in 2015 agrees with Linda Sarsour and says clearly that he has no objection to gay marriage and doesn't believe that the government should police morality. This was right around the time gay marriage was legalized in the US, so YQ can't say this was a decided issue and there was no room for opposition. There is always room for political opposition and speaking out in the US, especially on the issue of LGBT at that time when it was the national debate. Rather than side with the majority of non-Muslims who were opposed to this Qawm Lut movement, Yasser Qadi and his buddies sided with Qawm Lut and actively told Muslims to stand down and not oppose the tide. Watch this clip from 2015. In America, the position that I have held, which has caught, caused me trouble from both sides, is that it is a lost battle in America. The majority of states have acknowledged it. Right now, as we speak, the Supreme Court is looking at it again. And most likely, they're going to rule in favor that, because the issue has come, by the way, so 20-something states have allowed it, and 14 have not, or something. So, 
a couple that got married in one of the states moved to one of the states that doesn't allow it. So they're not being allowed health benefits and whatnot. So they have taken it to the Supreme Court. Right now, as we speak, the Supreme Court is looking into it. And in all likelihood, they're going to rule in favor of, 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 this, uh, of this arrangement and say that it must be binding in all states. Okay, So it's a lost battle. Majority of Christians and Jews in America have now embraced this. And it is only a small minority, the ultra-Orthodox Jews and the Evangelical and the Southern Baptists, mm -hmm. that's it, and the Catholics. I mean, they have not, even Catholicism, it'll change in a while, pretty sure. But, but it's a minority now. So it's a lost battle in terms of courts, in terms of public opinion. First of all, this is a lie. It is not a lost battle, and it is not this small fringe minority in America that has opposed this proliferation of rights. Just recently, these Qomlut supporters in America were shrieking at the possibility that the conservative Supreme Court may overturn the gay marriage ruling, just like they are on the verge of overturning their Roe v. Wade decision on abortion rights. For those of you not aware, Roe v. Wade is from 50 years ago that legalized abortion, but for decades the Christian right did not stop opposing abortion in this country. And now we're seeing the fruits of that effort as abortion rights are being curbed back in many U.S. states. These Christians never said it's a lost cause. They stood firm. But literally just a month or two after gay marriage legalization, Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi is telling Muslims it's a lost cause. So what does this mean for us as Muslims? What should we do about gay marriage uh, being legal? I mean, my position was that in this regard, we should not jump on the bandwagon of supporting legal gay marriage, nor should we jump on the bandwagon of trying to prohibit it. Rather, our position should be, and it's a controversial one, the American government should not have any right to decide what is or is not a marriage. It's not the role of our government. Now, again, I'm speaking from the American perspective. I'm not familiar with your constitution, your government. From an American perspective, morality is not in the domain of the government. But the government cannot impose on churches and synagogues and mosques its definition of marriage because that's not the domain of the constitution to tell us what is moral and immoral. So let the churches and synagogues and mosques preach their version of morality and marriage and let the U.S. Constitution and the governments and the courts decide whatever they want to do. So this is exactly what Qadi told Linda Sarsour and Mahdi Hassan in the previous clip. So he can't make the excuse, oh, it was a high-pressure situation with Al Jazeera. He repeated the same exact talking points in this low-pressure setting, talking to Muslims in Singapore in a random Q&A. But now it gets worse. And frankly, in America, again, and again, I don't know for your country, the more freedoms any group is given, the more freedoms we are given. The more freedoms any group is given, the less the government is involved in anything, the better it is for all of us to do as we want to do. Therefore, in some ways, it is helpful for the American Muslims to ally with the LGBT community. Believe it or not, and this has caused me a lot of problems in my circle to say this, right? Did you catch that? The more Qomlut writes, the better for Muslims. The more freedoms Qomlut has for its dhulm and fawahish, the more freedoms for Muslims. Therefore, Muslims should ally with Qomlut. This is what Yasser Qadi was teaching Muslims in 2015. In political issues, Honestly, those people are of the most understanding of our plight and the most supportive of, of campaign, campaigning against Islamophobia and the most powerful because they had the same issues in the 80s and they overcame it. And they're very sympathetic to our plight. Why can't we take their help? Can you believe this? According to Yasser Qadi, Qawm Lut is most sympathetic to Muslims. Really pause for a minute and soak this in. Could you as a Muslim imagine ever thinking such a thing, let alone saying it? Just imagine, this is someone who calls himself a scholar, a faqih even. 
And we know why Q doesn't say things haphazardly. He speaks very deliberately and carefully, yet this is his message over and over and over again. But it's awkward because our community doesn't understand. And then they want moral tolerance from us. And we have to be clear and say, no. And how do you explain this to them? We'll tolerate you politically, but not morally, <laughs> right? It, it, it raises questions and it's up to them, but I am not gonna compromise on this position. For me, this is qat'iyat. To be brutally honest, a Muslim who understands the Quran and he still says it is halal to engage in same sex, to me, this is kufr bawah, personally. This is open kufr, just like you say, khamr is halal, right? If he says riba is halal, and he knows Allah says in the Quran, riba. And he says riba is halal. To me, there is no ta'wil over here, right? In my humble opinion, the evidences of Qawm al-Wuf are just as qat'i. Look how he phrases it. Notice how Yasser Qadi is separating politics from morality, which is, you know, essentially what secularism is, by the way. He is banging his fist on the table. We will not compromise on same-sex acts being haram. It's like, who is questioning that? The whole question is, yeah, it's haram, everyone knows that, but can Muslims support these political positions legalizing LGBT rights? That is the whole question, and Yasser Qadi's trick is to talk tough on what he calls the morality aspect, so that it doesn't seem like he's completely selling out on the political aspect by saying that Muslims should support or can support LGBT rights. This is manipulation of his audience. He is banking on the fact that Muslims won't notice his sleight of hand. He's also banking on the fact that Muslims don't know that just like gay sex is haram, supporting the political right of people to not only engage in gay sex, but also to get married and enjoy non-discrimination benefits and get LGBT taught in schools and allow Qawm Lut to adopt children and on and on and on. Supporting these so called rights is also haram. It's also qat'i that it's haram because supporting the right of someone to do something is the same thing as supporting them doing that thing. I'll repeat that. Supporting the right of someone to do something is the same thing as supporting them doing that thing, doing that act. Yasser Qadi and Jonathan Brown and Yaqeen Institute have lied against Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam by saying that supporting Qawm Lut politically, supporting their rights is something permissible in Islam. This is a lie. Now if you think all this is bad, just listen to this. I was asked this, there were, there were a number of states that had voting for LGBT. California, Proposition 8, famous example, last year or something. And I got calls from California, what should we do, should we vote or not? And the majority of ulama said you should vote to ban it. I was one of the few that said, no, you shouldn't. Don't try to go become their enemies because it's actually gonna harm you in the long run. But then neither, should, in my opinion, should you vote for it because that is your tacit moral approval of something that is clearly against the shit. I said just, don't vote. <laughs> Abstain. You don't have to go vote in every single bill and amendment, right? Yeah. So in the US just eight or nine years ago, people were voting in different states whether to legalize gay marriage. And as he says, the majority of ulama were telling Muslims, vote against this, right? <laughs> Common sense. But Yasser Qadi was telling Muslims, no, don't oppose it. Can you imagine that? Some young people might not be able to imagine this, but there was a time where Qawm Lut rights were not recognized at all by non-Muslims. This was just eight or nine years ago, and they were holding elections allowing people to vote against these rights. And here you had a supposed conservative imam stopping Muslims from casting their vote against Qawm Lut. SubhanAllah. Every other election, of course, these compassionate imams are telling Muslims to definitely vote, get out your vote. 
and we have to choose the lesser of two evils. This is their message constantly. But when it comes to voting to stop Qomlut, then suddenly they don't want Muslims to vote. By the way, this is also the answer to those who say, as Muslims, we cannot oppose LGBT rights because we can't impose our Islamic morality on others. This is frankly a moronic thing to say because first of all, states were having elections they were giving people the opportunity to vote on the law and impose one view or the other. Why wouldn't Muslims take that opportunity then? And why wouldn't Muslims take the opportunity now to stand against all the new Qomlut rights that are constantly being proposed? Now is the time to voice opposition. Second of all, these social justice Muslims that Yasser Qadi is friends with, people like Omar Soleiman and Linda Sarsour and Ilhan Omar, all that these activists do all day is police morality and call and demand for changing the law to impose their liberal moral imperatives on society, whether it's concerning immigration law or abortion law or healthcare or reproductive rights or whatever other left-wing cause they're fighting for. So it's okay for these activists to literally protest confront police and get arrested fighting establishment laws in the American government. But when it comes to Qomlut, Muslims shouldn't organize or show any opposition because that is imposing our Islamic morality. This is clearly hypocritical behavior and treachery. Now back to Yasser Qadi, he might complain that Oh, that was my view seven years ago, and that's not what I believe now. So let's look at some clips from the past couple of years. Two years ago, YQ held this conference at his masjid that he led along with Omar Soleiman. The whole title of this conference is Balancing Our Faith with Civil Rights. Just think about that title. Are we going to change or in any way modify our faith? our Islam, our Iman, to balance with something else, anything else, let alone a kufr ideology, let alone the ideology of Qomlut. This is the official title of their conference. So you can just imagine the amount of garbage that was spewed there, which was in a masjid, by the way. But consider this statement. The point is that we need to be very clear here. There is a hypocrisy and a double standard for those who claim to practice liberalism. Liberalism is meant to preach, live and let live. If you want us to be like that, okay, fine. Let us be our way and you be your way. We are willing to get to that level. But what is happening is no, we are not even allowed to preach and teach in our own masajid. We're not even allowed to hold our own views without some sense of social and in some countries legal ramifications. We are being portrayed as being the inherently evil simply for holding internal views. And the irony seems to be lost on those who used to advocate for freedom for all that they are not willing to give freedom for all when people disagree with them. So we will and we must fight this moral and legal battle. We have the right to be who we are. If you want us to give you that right, we demand the same right in return. And our values and views cannot be criminalized. So this conference was in 2020. He repeats the same logic he was pushing all the way back in 2015. You allow us to be Muslim and we will give you LGBT rights. Qomlut wants to be Qomlut? No problem. Just please let us be Muslim. How is this Islamically acceptable in the first place? Did Lut salam say to his people, I acknowledge your rights as long as you acknowledge mine? Now, YQ is complaining in this clip about the current state of Qom Lut and how they have made it so that any opposition to Qom Lut is being criminalized. But doesn't he have the basic common sense to ask, how did we get to this point? Don't you think before gay marriage was legalized in 2015, people like you should have opposed that legislation so that we wouldn't arrive at our current situation today? But no, at that time, you were telling Muslims not to vote against it. What is deeply ironic is that in 2020, Qadi says this. And one of the main tactics that is being employed is the equation of gay rights with civil rights. The claim that one's sexual identity is akin to one's racial identity. 
He says one of the main tactics is turning the LGBT issue into a civil rights issue. Yet in 2015, when you're sitting with Linda, she says this. This is a civil rights issue. We have no place as American Muslims targeted in the United States of America to oppose another marginalized group in this country, which includes LGBTQ communities. I actually agree with Linda here is that I understand the American government should not be in the job of policing morality. She explicitly says this is a civil rights issue. So good job, Yasser. You played your part sitting there and nodding. You did your part putting an imam's face on what you yourself call the main tactic of the Qom Lut agenda. From that same conference on the issue of allyship and supporting politicians like Ilhan Omar or Sadiq Khan in the UK, Yasser Qadi says this. The issue of Muslims in America allying with, forming political allegiances with other people and individuals that might also support the LGBT agenda. We have two other speakers that will be talking about this in more detail. It is clearly one of the most contentious issues and one that cannot be resolved in a few minutes. Simplistically put, the right demonizes Muslims. The right wants to ban us. The right wants to ban Islam. The right wants to invade Muslim lands across the globe. And the left, it doesn't like, maybe even it hates some things that are Islamic, some aspects that are orthopraxy and orthodoxy. So what do we do here? On the one hand, one group doesn't like us for who we are, but they agree with some morality. On the other hand, one group is willing to embrace us. They want us, they want that diversity, but they don't like the fact that we are morally different from them. And this is very problematic. I mean, we're not going to mention any names here, but there are some very, very famous politicians running for president. No names mentioned here, but they are everything we want them to be. Pro-immigration, pro-health rights, um, anti-war, anti-imperialism, pro-Palestinian, anti-APAC. I mean, this is like a, a, a win after win. I mean, again, no names mentioned over here, but clearly there are some burning issues that we are talking about in the Muslim community. There are clearly lines in the sand that are clearly being drawn here and no doubt these burning sand issues that we're talking about some of these candidates we really really are happy at everything unbelievable except except their stance on LGBT consistently some of these people have been arguing for LGBT rights what do we do I don't have an answer I do not have an answer hmm you don't have an answer Yasser are you sure? Because elsewhere, you told the Muslim community that we should support such politicians like Ilhan. I'll show you the proof in a second, inshallah, but just wanted to note this silly dichotomy that he sets up between the left and the right, making it sound like the left wing just loves Muslims and is going to do everything they can to help us and help Palestine. And they just have this small little itsy bitsy issue. Are you noticing how these compassionate imams manipulate their audience? In what world has the left wing ever been anything but pro-war, pro-corruption, pro-Zionism? Ilhan Omar has cooperated with AIPAC and voted for unconditional military aid to Israel. Yes, she has some token criticisms of Israel, just lip service really to make it seem like she's fighting the establishment when in reality she's part and parcel of the same corrupt political establishment. All she is is controlled opposition. So how could anyone who has even the most basic knowledge of American politics not recognize all this when it comes to war, when it comes to Palestine, when it comes to opposing Islam? There is a complete two-party consensus on all these issues, and this has always been the case. Someone like Yasser Qadi really should understand that. At the same time, the other side is forming alliances that they think is for the betterment of the ummah, and they're getting some tangible results. When the presidential candidate invites a mainstream Muslim speaker to his campaign last night, that is clearly not just a symbolic victory. It is a massive victory for Islam in America. But that's not going to happen if those types of individuals have statements that will be problematic. It's a give and take. Even as you criticize some of those Muslim individuals, whether you 
you like it or not, you are benefiting from their presence. You are benefiting from the fact that they have been given that platform. And it's very easy to criticize, but there is no easy alternative. Yeah, there is an easy alternative, Yasser. Don't ally with people who are leading to the loss of Iman in the Muslim community. Easy. Don't promote open, unapologetic fusaq as Muslim leaders. Easy. And what is this massive benefit Muslims have gotten that you keep mentioning? What kind of delusion is this that Muslims have benefited from the likes of Ilhan Omar? Please, someone explain in a clear way, how have Orthodox religious Muslims benefited from Ilhan? And I'm not talking about liberalized Muslims and compassionate Imams. They have clearly benefited because if you sell out your Iman and liberalize, there's always a place for you in this sick world. But for religious Muslims, what is the massive world-changing benefit that someone like Yasser Qadi has to keep mentioning to justify his support of such a deviant? Now here is another talk YQ gave, and what is notable about this is that YQ and his supporters share this particular video as some kind of proof that YQ does not compromise on LGBT. But listen to what he actually says. If they want us to join their rally for their civil rights, this is a deeper topic, and my position has been very clear from the beginning since the Supreme Court allowed this. Muslims, we don't have to get involved in every political issue of this land. And I personally am against endorsing LGBT rights unconditionally. Sometimes it's better to be quiet. Listen carefully. He says, I am against endorsing LGBT rights unconditionally. So does he think we can endorse them conditionally? That's what he said in 2015 and in multiple other instances. He has said that he personally cannot endorse, but if other Muslims want to support Qamlut rights, he cannot condemn that or say that it is haram. In fact, according to Qadi, there is a lot of benefit for Muslims because more Qamlut rights somehow, some way, magically means more rights for Muslims. The issue of politics and LGBT does become complicated in a more technical sense. So much can be said. There is a spectrum of permissible opinion from the theological perspective. Those who want to rally against it, I see where they're coming from and I understand it. Those that are technically saying, I will support the political right, but not the moral right. This is problematic insofar as it's very nuanced and very few people will understand. And you're sending a mixed message to your own kids. Do you really think your children will understand? I don't support you morally, but I support you politically. But still, those who do so, I can't say that they are sinful in the eyes of Allah. They might be unwise, they might be doing something foolish in the long run, but morally speaking, they haven't crossed the red line in my eyes. This is my opinion, my ijtihad, that those who say the American government has no business dictating morality, and therefore I will say the American government should have nothing to do with who gets married and what not, I personally believe this is a dangerous position because you send a double message to our community. So according to Qadi, there is a spectrum on supporting LGBT rights. Those like me and all of you who are listening, inshallah, who say we have to oppose these rights, he says he sees where we're coming from. But those who say we should support LGBT rights, people like Jonathan Brown or Ilhan Omar or even himself in 2015, he can't say they are sinful in the eyes of Allah. What's funny is how he doesn't acknowledge that he is talking about exactly his own view from 2015. He was one of these people that tried to separate morality from politics. I actually agree with Linda here is that I understand the American government should not be in the job of policing morality. I support the notion that the American government is not in charge of morality. Okay, so you're not opposed very... to same-sex marriage? Politically, yes, but le but morally, I, I I don't agree with this. So there's a there's a distinction. But as a law of the, the land, you're not I agree. campaigning to I, change yeah, the law. Of course not. Those that are technically saying I will support the political right, but not the moral right. This is 
problematic insofar as it's very nuanced and very few people will understand and you're sending a mixed message to your own kids do you really think your children will understand I don't support you morally but I support you politically he is literally quoting himself and saying that this is a dangerous view that's exactly what you're saying in front of Linda Sarsour and Mahdi Hassan in that Al Jazeera interview but now Qadi wants to pretend like this was the view of others in fact he throws Linda under the bus well, the, the interview there is okay. public, so actually, the, you're right, this is public, so it's Linda Sarsour in okay. this case, right? Yeah. And here in England, we actually had a, a, a nice yani, conversation about this, like, look, yeah. I said I understand what you're doing, and I disagree with these issues because yeah. you, do, you do give an ambiguous message. When yeah. you say, politically, we don't want the American government to get involved. And you never bring, I said, she, she, we know this, she never brings in Islam. She never says Islam allows this. She never says this, right? So I said, I appreciate that. that you're, and she herself, you know, she's not wanting to reinterpret the faith. That's not her job or role. Mm -hmm. But she's saying, politically, I want the government to not get involved, right? The private issues between men and women or whatnot. This is not the government's role to do. Their freedom is our freedom, basically. Their freedom to do whatever is our freedom to do that. I say, I understand this, but it is also... Please understand that we also find issues problematic with this. Yes. And of them is, you do send a double message to our younger kids. Exactly. Yeah. Right? That was exactly what you said in the Al Jazeera interview and elsewhere. That's not what Linda said. Linda Al Meskina was just sitting there. You were the one spewing this garbage. It's funny how Yasser thinks of himself as a historian, more like a historical revisionist. But one thing to notice also, he said in that earlier clip that supporting LGBT political rights as a Muslim, it's a dangerous view. It's a view that leads to confusion in the Muslim community. But notice what he says. He says, ultimately, it is a position he cannot condemn. Well, why not? Why can't he condemn it if it's dangerous? I'll tell you why. He can't condemn it because he would have to condemn his friends. He would have to condemn his colleagues at Yaqeen Institute. He would have to condemn Jonathan Brown and Omar Soleiman. He would also have to condemn himself for spreading this danger and exactly this confusion that he's talking about and he's now complaining about and he's attributing it to Linda Sarsour and others. But it's interesting that here he acknowledges the danger. So he's not completely ignorant. That actually makes it worse. He knows the danger, but he still refuses to take a stand. He still refuses to condemn and boycott the likes of Ilhan Omar and others for their support of Qawm Lut rights. The long and the short of it is YQ has never taught the correct and qat'i position on this to the Muslim community. He has never said it is absolutely impermissible for Muslims to support LGBT rights. And in fact, Muslims must stand against the proliferation of this fahisha. Instead of speaking the truth, YQ has waffled over the years between his initial position of gay rights benefit Muslims and his more recent position of, well, maybe it's better we don't support gay rights, but I have no problem with my buddies who do support it. Do you now see the depth of the confusion, the depth of the dishonesty from these reformists, my brothers and sisters? Do you see how they twist words and rewrite the past to avoid accountability? Just ask yourself, do you all have more understanding of Islam and more understanding of the basic realities of this world than this so-called Sheikh, Doctor, PhD? Now let's get back to what he was saying about Ilhan Omar. What if the one running against her is a hardcore fanatic anti-Muslim bigot, okay. which is most likely the case, yeah. the Republican Party, right? Yeah. What if she's the Democratic nominee and we have the other guy who wants to eliminate your mosque? Yeah, yeah. So again, be practical and, be pra and leave the Messiah and the Fasid to the, the people, people of, of, of the, the yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let the people of the locality decide. Yeah. And that is why none of our mainstream du'at of the, of the West have taken these individuals as enemies. Even if we publicly, I just said publicly, yeah, yeah, publicly. I disagree with yeah, yeah, yeah. right? I disagree, but let us decide the Masala and the And guess what? We might be wrong, guys. We mm. might be wrong. But at the end of the day, it's our ijtihad to do in our localities. 
So here YQ continues to make his case for Ilhan. He says a few interesting things. First he says, what if the choice is between Ilhan and a politician who wants to shut down mosques? This is a cheap emotional tactic. YQ is banking on the fact that the audience has no clue about American politics. Ilhan Omar has never ran against a candidate who wanted to eliminate mosques. In fact, there are no such candidates in US national politics saying that we need to eliminate or shut down mosques. This is a farcical boogeyman that left-wing Muslims tell naive religious Muslims in order to scare them into voting for Khabith Democratic candidates. They tell naive Muslims that if you don't vote Democratic, the Republicans will throw all Muslims in concentration camps. This is literally what YQ says later in this same video, actually. Now, do you want to see the Republican candidate that was running against Ilhan Omar in 2018? Her name is Jennifer Zielinski, and this is her platform. And that what I'm standing for is less government and reining in government regulation. Mm -hmm. Getting the government out of people's lives and giving people in the Minnesota's 5th Congressional District and also across our state more freedom and more choice in how they live their lives. And I'm going to reach out to as many voters as possible. This is the big evil Islamophobe that is threatening our mosques and we better support Ilhan or else. <laughs> what a joke. I tried to find one anti-Muslim statement from this woman. I couldn't find any, which makes sense because that district in Minnesota is a huge Muslim district, and it would be career suicide for a politician there to say anything close to Islamophobic. But besides this, Qadi reveals something major in that clip. He says that none of the mainstream du'at oppose the likes of Ilhan Omar and Linda Sarsour. This is very dishonest because in reality, he and his buddies have actively supported Ilhan Omar, Linda Sarsour, Keith Ellison, and other left-wing deviants. It's not just that they haven't opposed, they have actually supported and promoted. But also, who are these mainstream Duat? When YQ says mainstream, he is referring to him and his friends only. As soon as you disagree with their ijtihad and call it out for the fraud that it is, then you're no longer mainstream. In fact, many imams and du'at, including myself, have opposed these fusaq politicians and activists and pointed out all the harms that they're causing to the Muslim community. We have been doing this for years, but YQ would say, Oh, you're not mainstream. This is how the Dawa Mafia insulates itself and pretends like it represents the community. It's all self-proclaimed leadership and authority. Also notice how YQ says explicitly, this is our ijtihad in America. Excuse me, who said Yasser Qadi is a mujtahid? Who gave him the right to make ijtihad on these issues? And even if he were a mujtahid in his wildest imagination, someone who doesn't even have a degree in fiqh, by the way, he's completely ignorant about the key political and social realities related to LGBT, as he has demonstrated in just this few selection of clips. So the last person who needs to be making ijtihad on this issue is this guy and his ignorant friends. Now, he does acknowledge maybe our ijtihad will turn out wrong. Wow, how humble of the mujtahid to admit this. Well, has he now realized how wrong he was in the two years since this clip was recorded? Are he and the mainstream du'at going to apologize for their mistakes and own up to all the damage they have caused to the Muslim community with their so-called ijtihad? Are they going to apologize to their critics who oppose this ijtihad? Critics that YQ himself arrogantly smeared as neophytes, ignoramuses, dogs, donkeys, and other derogatory terms? Now let's turn to Omar Soleiman. Before we get to the issue of Omar Soleiman's partnership with pro-LGBT groups for years now, let's get back to the ICNA conference. Here we see Ilhan, Keith Ellison, and this Christian minister named William Barber. 
We have covered Ellison on Muslim Skeptic before and how he's a huge advocate for abortion, LGBT, and Israel, and his connections with people like Omar Soleiman. So check that out on MuslimSkeptic.com. But who is this William Barber? Barber is notable because in 2020, at that same Balancing Our Faith with Qom Lut Rights conference at YQ's Masjid that I mentioned earlier, in Omar Suleiman's talk, he recommended Barber by name and praised him as a multi-faith leader. This video has been unlisted on YouTube for some reason, which means people can't search for it and it won't show up unless you have the direct link. I guess Omar Suleiman or Epic Masjid want as few people to see it as possible, but check out this clip where Omar Suleiman is outlining his so-called Sunnah framework for faithful activism, and he's listing the levels of allyship. He gives six levels of allyship and the groups that are at the highest levels of allyship are the groups that supposedly have the most in common with Muslims, according to Omar Suleiman. Level five, engaging forums that discuss the advancement of family values, social order, wholesome morality, etc., with authentic paradigms. So this is kind of on the right of the aisle now. Here's some things to consider. What's our unique intervention to society? What are our legitimate solutions to society's legitimate problems that often get hijacked by illegitimate agendas? Uh, how do we differentiate between well-meaning individuals and big agendas? When people come to the masjid to support you as allies from any community, don't assume that they're part of some grand agenda and scheme to ruin you. All right? Most people are just well-meaning individuals, right, that you can talk to and not cast an entire assumption of them uh, being a part of these great agendas. Find val balanced voices to work with on different uh, sides of the spectrum. Voices like Reverend William Barber, who champions the Poor People's Campaign. So William Barber is one of these well-meaning voices that Omar Soleiman says will come to our masjids to ally on moral issues. And we should not assume he has some big agenda to destroy our community. Omar Suleiman is naming Barber as one of these people Muslims should ally with at level five, which is the level of traditional values and morality on the basis of what he calls an authentic paradigm. So these are the people who are supposed to have a lot in common with Muslims. But who is Barber? Is he this traditional voice of morality that Omar Suleiman is making him out to be? OS has actually a lot of experience working with Barber. Check out this clip from 2019. The same forces are pushing a faulty theological position that says as long as you're against gay people, against women, and against uh, and for guns and for prayer in the school and for tax cuts, that is a godly way. The same people against these the people here are pushing a war economy. We see all of these interlocking injustices and we are raising a moral intersectional fusion movement against it. All of us, every color, every race, every creed, every sexuality, we are very clear. So you see Barber saying that it's not true that being against gay people is a godly way. It's not a godly way to be against gay people. And Suleiman is standing there behind Barber next to the rainbow flag. When we look at Barber's career, we see that he has a long history being a passionate advocate for the LGBT cause. So as an African American, because my family was impacted by America's original sin, both as an African American and as a part Tuscarora Native American, I have to be against any attack of violence policy-wise or otherwise on the LGBT community because I know what the original sin leads to. Find val balanced voices to work with on different uh, sides of the spectrum. Voices like Reverend William Barber. And I can't do that. And uh, we're not going to cut people off like that. And they say, well, but it ain't the same as being black. I said, I know that. I'm born black. I have to tell you if I'm gay. But because I'm born black and I know that what the codification of inequality will do once ever you put it in the law, that's why I stand against any form of codification of inequality because I know what it can do. Okay, come on with it. So 
don't, don't. And then I said, you know, and then, I, you know, I can't do it because my denomination is affirming and, and bringing all people in. And when I was consecrated bishop, I was consecrated. I didn't go to a straight person to be consecrated. Because I started saying, you know, that's a little paternalistic that I always have to be the one that welcomes gay people. Like they need my affirmation. So I flipped it over and I went to a same gender loving bishop who consecrated me to receive affirmation from a same gender loving because I believe that there's no less Holy Ghost and spirit and whatnot in her. And she's actually is a same gender loving woman. Balanced voices, voices like Reverend William Barber. When you attack the LGBT community, that's a form of political violence in a society that guarantees equal protection under the law. When you seek to use religion to promote hate and harm, and when you misuse religion and you create a heresy out of the word evangelicalism, Balanced voices, voices like Reverend William Barber. I want you to know that when hands that once picked cotton join hands of Latinos, join hands of progressive whites, join faith hands and labor hands and Asian hands and Native American hands and poor hands and wealthy hands with a conscience and gay hands and straight hands and trans hands and Christian hands and Jewish hands and Muslim hands and Hindu hands and Buddhist hands. When we all get together. Spectrum voices like Reverend William Barber. Now someone might object. Sure, this is how Barber talks to his own church or to fellow Christians, but he wouldn't speak like this at a Muslim conference like ICNA. Well, guess again, 2022 is not the first time Barber has spoken at ICNA. In 2015, he gave the ICNA keynote speech at one of their annual banquets, a speech that you can watch for yourself on the ICNA YouTube channel. When we live in a country that sings God's grace, about God's grace being shed on us, but we find ourselves having to battle against those who want to deny grace and equal protection to the immigrant community, to people regardless of their sexuality, when they want to deny women's rights, we have a moral crisis. According to Barber, there is a moral crisis if anyone wants to deny God's grace and equal protection to people based on sexuality. This is what he is preaching directly to Muslims. This is Omar Soleiman's specially selected partner for level five allyship, promoting advancement of family values and wholesome morality. This guy, this lesbian ordained minister from a gay affirming denomination that is screaming about gay hands and trans hands with Muslim hands working together, this is the kind of person Omar Soleiman is constantly platforming and promoting to the Muslim community. Such a person really has no business lecturing the Muslim community or being given any sort of platform or recognition at even the smallest masjid, let alone a huge national convention like ICNA. Yet this is the type of person Soleiman wants us to ally with and respect. Again, it's not like Omar Suleiman doesn't know Barber's views. OS has literally stood right there behind him next to this rainbow flag when Barber was making his passionate plea for Qawm Lut. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Barber is from this LGBT affirming denomination. These are Christian denominations that reformed in order to become LGBT affirming. And that is exactly the plan that they have for the Muslim community. Now we can't be too surprised here because Omar Soleiman has brazenly justified his allyship with worse individuals. I mean, let's be real here. Not only has he justified these kinds of allyships like his participation in the interfaith shirk rituals with LGBT priestesses, he actually calls it sunnah activism. What does Omar Suleiman really mean by sunnah activism? Well, before we answer that, let's look at this clip. Omar Suleiman and his minions have been sending this clip to anyone that asks whether or not he supports LGBT rights. They have been using this clip to smear me personally as a liar and an exaggerator. 
So in this podcast, the host asks Omar Soleiman directly about allying with pro-LGBT and other groups that are Islamically problematic. What would you say if somebody kind of criticizes you or anyone else for, for that, for you know, sharing a platform with such and such person or, you know, um, you know, you know the, the, the usual criticism. I mean, what's your, uh, what's your view about that? I think I think. Look, there are the loud. Uh, th there are the, the 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 very you know <laughs> the very far criticisms that are uh, that that just accuse Muslims of of of, of you know seriously uh, wrong things. And then there are the fair critics. So I want to focus on fair critics, right? So yeah. I think it is a very fair criticism. A very fair criticism that when you go to a space. Are you lending more credibility to that space? Or are you bringing an Islamic uh, presence to that space? And it's something that we have to juggle in our lives yeah. uh, all the time. Really? Is that something we have to juggle in our lives? Is the average Muslim often faced with the prospect of working with the most rabid supporters of Fahisha, the most liberal social justice activists? Is this a common situation for Muslims? Or is Omar Soleiman just projecting? You know, I think that the, the answer to that is that we need to develop frameworks, right? So, uh, you know, Sheikh Dawood Walid wrote the book Towards Sacred Activism. I recently actually taught a class at Qalam uh, with the seminary students and, and put out the notes on uh, Towards a Sunnah Framework. I think we need to build up our framework so that we're not ambiguous, right? Yeah. I don't think that we can. We can. Uh, actually, let me just put it this way. We cannot, uh, not I don't think, we cannot ever support anything religiously, politically, uh, socially, culturally that is opposed to the Quran and the Sunnah, not in the capacity of LGBT politics or in the capacity of uh, CVE or surveillance or some of the others. Mm -hmm. We can't support any of that stuff any of it, any element of it that opposes the Quran and the Sunnah. Well, that was pretty clear, right? He says with a chuckle that we cannot ever support anything that opposes Quran and Sunnah, whether in the capacity of LGBT politics or anything else. So case closed, right? But wait, what part of LGBT politics conflicts with the Quran and Sunnah exactly? Does repeatedly allying with and platforming pro-LGBT groups and activists oppose the Quran and Sunnah? Does publishing an article at your institute telling Muslims that they should affirm and advocate many LGBTQ rights, including gay marriage, does that conflict with the Quran and Sunnah? Because not only has Omar Suleiman done all of these things, he has also aggressively defended all of these things. So is he suffering from cognitive dissonance or is he playing word games with us? Right, so the idea is how do you live the Quran and the Sunnah in the public space? And if you're in a society, a pluralistic society, uh, you're going to have to work with people who hold differing beliefs and differing, you know, differing viewpoints than you. How we, how we can, you know, really in, encourage people, look, you know, come to the table, uh, be the, you know, be yourself, be who you are. You, you know, you're a Christian, you're a Jew, you're, you're a Muslim, whoever you are. You don't have to compromise your, you don't have to compromise your religion. Like we don't have to start mixing liturgies and prayers in order to, uh, to be a healthy cooperation, right? So. Mm. What we're looking for is that everyone has their particularities. Uh, we certainly have ours as Muslims, right? As Orthodox Muslims. So the, the question becomes, what's a healthy table to be at? And so I think it's important for us to work on issues and be very specific to the issues that we're working on. That doesn't mean seeking problematic alliances. That means that there are inevitably going to be times that if you're going to be effective in society and work on these specific issues, whether it's a homelessness or, or, or poverty or, or policing or racism or healthcare, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. That there are inevitably going to be people at the table that are not going to agree with you on a lot and you're not going to agree with them on a lot. So what, what, what's important for us is stick to the issues, um, be unambiguous about where we stand on our own identity mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, not to, not to carry out or not to carry on the baggage of everyone else and then to find that place of harmony and, and coexistence that's important, inshallah, for us all. 
as we're living in these societies. So we should create frameworks. And I think that's what's going to help us navigate through. So some major assumptions here. First, Soleiman continually conflates allying with Jews and Christians with allying with Qawm Lut. This is not analogous at all. Yes, Ahlul Kitab are Kuffar, but Qawm Lut are Kuffar plus Musrifun, and they're the worst Fasiqun as described in the Quran. Secondly, what both Yasser Qadi and Omar Suleiman continually assert or just assume when they talk about this issue is that Qawm Lut are the friends of Muslims. This is completely false. Anyone can open their phone, their internet browser, read the news, and see exactly how Qawm Lut are attacking all religious groups, including Muslims, including Islam, not only in America, but around the world. These are people who are open enemies to Islam and to all believers, to all Orthodox Muslims. But the compassionate Imams are constantly doing PR for Qawm Lut and pretending that that these are well-wishers that we want to sit with at the same table. Thirdly, OS makes three conditions for allying with these groups. He says, first, we have to stick to the issues. Second, we have to be unambiguous about where we stand. And third, we have to not carry any baggage. So let's go through these conditions and see if Omar Suleiman's own activism meets these conditions. And let's consider the infamous interfaith migrant march with the pagan rituals. We bring this consecrated water to the border wall because water knows no border. Yes. Now, some of you might not remember the whole context of that. The whole context prior to me releasing that video showing Suleiman participating in pagan practices, singing Christian songs, presiding over oil anointments, the whole context was a massive debate about Muslim political engagement and allyship. This has been an ongoing debate. On one side, Omar Suleiman and the Dawah Mafia argued that Muslims must be politically involved and ally with the left by voting for people like Ilhan Omar, by marching with Linda Sarsour, by supporting LGBT rights, etc., etc. On the other side, people like me were saying no. Absolutely not. These allyships, these political stances, etc., etc., all of this is leading to deviance in the community. All of this is compromising clear cut Islamic ethics and principles. And ultimately, it's resulting in a loss of Iman for so many Muslims. The Dawah Mafia and their orgs resorted to all kinds of dirty tactics to silence people like me for pointing this stuff out and criticizing them. They branded me a liar, an extremist, a neo-medkhali who is also somehow a neo-khariji. They use these terms knowing it will draw the attention of security agencies. They have also worked very hard to bully virtually every masjid I speak at to cancel my invitations and on and on. So in context of this debate, this wider debate, I said, look, Omar Suleiman claims that allying with these groups politically is sunnah. It's part of what he calls his sunnah framework. So let's actually see what this sunnah activism looks like in practice. So I posted pictures of that specific event with Omar Suleiman and I said, hey, read the articles about the event. It was full of kufr. Look at these pictures of the event. This is all crazy, objectionable stuff. How can any Muslim, let alone an imam, support this and call it sunnah and prophetic as Omar Suleiman has been doing? When I posted these pictures on Facebook, the Dawah Mafia immediately rushed to defend their boy. Yasser Qadi, Zaid Shaker, even that second tier British guy who for some reason loves joking about his underwear, they all jumped to praise that specific event as an exemplary case of all the good that Muslim political activism brings. 
They praised Omar Suleiman as a fearless leader and they smeared me as a liar and a shaitan. So as a response to their smear campaign, I simply posted the video of the event, which you can watch in full with or without my commentary on the Muslim Skeptic channel. And that pretty much settled the debate as far as I was concerned. So that's the larger context. And Omar Suleiman in this podcast, he's just doing damage control. But the funny thing is when he mentions these three conditions of allyship, he is essentially refuting himself because these are things he himself does not practice. First condition, we have to strictly stick to the issues. Was he sticking to the issues when he engaged in these pagan rituals? Second condition, we have to be unambiguous where we stand. Has Omar Soleiman been unambiguous about where he stands Islamically on LGBT? Has he ever made a clear statement that supporting LGBT rights is haram and condemn the pro-LGBT activists and politicians like Ilhan Omar and Linda Sarsour for engaging in the haram? Or has he legitimized them and partnered with them time and time again? How is that being unambiguous, especially since actions speak louder than words? Third condition, we cannot take on the baggage of other groups. Well, has Omar Soleiman avoided taking on baggage from the pro-LGBT groups and the various liberal groups he has partnered with? Of course not. He has been completely flattened. He's been squashed under the weight of all the baggage he is carrying for all these left-wing causes. So the main reason why we do this shit, why we do music as Cure for Paranoia is basically let you know it don't matter what fucking gender, sex, sexual orientation, mother disability you got, you can do whatever the fuck you want to do. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Imam Omar Solomon. This is a dire moment. I want to start off with two statements from American heroes. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to this moment against fear. There is the body of a woman that's precious to us all that still has not been buried, a Tatiana Jefferson. I hope that tonight we continue to uplift love and we don't allow those manufactured fears. A gay man in this state where I could legally be fired, I might be afraid for my job. If I were a trans woman of color in a state and a country where trans women of color are being killed with complete impunity, I too may be afraid. And that's a real fear. In this video, for example, he attends a rally for a politician who was trying to force all churches, synagogues, and mosques to acknowledge LGBT rights or lose their nonprofit status. Omar Soleiman knew about this politician's position, yet he still attended this rally, which was full of all kinds of shocking and un-Islamic stuff, by the way. So Omar Soleiman is basically condemning Omar Soleiman. He is condemning himself. Now again, we have to ask, when he says in this podcast that we cannot ever support anything that opposes Quran and Sunnah, whether in the capacity of LGBT politics or anything else, what does he really mean by this? He clearly says that allying with these kinds of groups is not only permissible, it's actually inevitable. You can't escape it, which I think when he says that, that's a kind of a damning statement in and of itself. Of course, Muslims can avoid allying with Qawm Lut. It's not really that hard. Does Omar Soleiman think that the only way to stand against poverty, or the only way to stand against police brutality is to stand next to someone draped in a rainbow flag? It's only inevitable if all your activism goes through left-wing democratic groups. Then, yeah, then it's inevitable because the left-wing ensures that Qawm Lut is included in everything. In fact, this is their entire strategy for normalizing Qawm Lut. They know that if an imam stands next to a rainbow flag in a protest march, that imam is going to have much more trouble speaking out against Qawm Lut in his masjid. So that's their strategy, and Omar Soleiman has been only too willing to be the pawn in this game.
And that's why he thinks allying with Qom Lut is inevitable. But in reality, no one is stopping Muslims from advocating for causes like poverty or police brutality or homelessness without these kinds of un-Islamic associations. Now, what is really crazy is that according to Suleiman, allying with Qom Lut is not only inevitable, it's also Sunnah. This is the position he has defended over and over again in multiple essays and multiple talks detailing his so-called Sunnah framework. He argues explicitly that allying with pro-LGBT social groups is Sunnah because that's what the Prophet ﷺ would have done himself. Can you imagine that? The Prophet ﷺ would ally with such groups? Can you believe that an Imam would claim this? And his evidence for this is an incident referred to as Hilf al-Fudul. Suleiman, of course, completely misconstrues this Hilf al-Fudul as we have written about on MuslimSkeptic.com. So check out our Yaqeen review if you're interested in further details on that. But the point is Omar Suleiman is using this Hilf al-Fudul argument to justify his actions and claim that it is perfectly fine and even praiseworthy for a Muslim to go march with LGBT priestesses and speak at LGBT vigils and so on and so on. We are determined to cry together to pray together, to stand together, straight, gay, Floridian, and Texan. All of this is part of what Omar Sulaiman calls the Sunnah framework. And even more than this, according to his Yaqeen Institute, affirming and advocating LGBTQ rights and gay marriage is consistent with the Quran and Sunnah. That's the position Yaqeen's director of research, Jonathan Brown, has loudly and aggressively defended for years. But as I said before, I, I don't think, I, I'm not going to do this kind of public lambasting of, of her of, or of yeah, another yeah. Muslim sister, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not asking you to lambast. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't support gay marriage. I support the right to marriage for gay people. You explicitly specified Muslims should support gay marriage under U.S. law. I said the right to gay marriage. Yeah, okay. Same big thing. difference. Big, eh, 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 eh. Not the same thing. Big okay. difference. When you're saying we should, uh, in fact, engage in so much as we would um, support the right of gay marriage, doesn't this seem very contrary um, to the da'wah of Lut, for example, who very much was opposed to these kinds of practices? let alone facilitated it. On what Islamic... I don't think Lut, I don't think Lut Salam, talked about gay marriage. How does this make any sense? How can you support the right of people to do something haram? Imagine for a second if Lut salam, told his people, yeah, your fahisha is technically haram, but we can still support your right to engage in the haram. Imagine Lut salam, saying this. Lut, by the way, was not in a Muslim society. He was in a corrupt non-Muslim society. Contrary to the Sunnah of the Anbiya, however, Yaqeen, Omar Sulaiman, and Yasir Qadi have promoted and supported this idea of supporting Qawm Lut rights over all these years. Meanwhile, increasingly, Muslim kids are being forced to learn LGBT curricula in schools. Muslim businesses are being forced to abide by LGBT discrimination policies, uh, abide by transgender bathroom ordinances, and Muslims are being charged with hate speech and being jailed for simply saying what Lut salam, said to his people as recorded in the Quran. These are the LGBT rights that Yasser Qadi said at first it's fine to support, and then later he changed his view to, well, it's a valid ijtihad to support. Interesting to note, after four years and lots of intense criticism from Muslim skeptic and others, Yaqeen has finally taken down Brown's paper, but they haven't retracted it. They haven't apologized for it. They haven't clarified anything about it. They just say that they have 
archived it and leave this bizarre note that Brown's position has been rendered obsolete by Supreme Court rulings. Which Supreme Court rulings are they talking about? His paper was published two years after the Supreme Court ruling legalizing gay marriage, and in that paper, he tells Muslims to support gay marriage. So this note makes absolutely no sense, and it's kind of hilarious that it says Brown stridently upheld the orthodox Islamic sexual norms. Now let me give a final example of the fruits of Omar Soleiman's dawah. Since we already mentioned Barber and how much Omar Soleiman praises Barber as an example of an ally. Barber has these regular protest marches for the poor. Helping the poor is a good cause, of course. So Omar Soleiman on at least one occasion attended with Barber. We already showed one clip of this where Barber is talking about LGBT with Omar Soleiman just standing there, but there's something even more problematic at that protest. The attention center will close down. We didn't close it. They closed us when they saw us coming. Mm -hmm. Your very present, they closed the door. But while they may close us out, they cannot close out the spirit of God. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And so right now here, we want to have a blessing for those who are hungering and thirsting on the inside physically. Yeah. yeah. Because they hunger and thirst outside for justice and righteousness. Yeah. And how many of us join them in that thirst? Everyone yes. That thirst. Yes. Would you reach forward and put your hands on somebody forward until everybody's touching somebody and touching the fire? And repeat after me, this water has come from struggles all over the country. Where people are thirsting. Where people are thirsting. For righteousness. For righteousness. For righteousness. And for justice. And for justice. In the name of all that is holy. In the name of all that is holy. We believe. We believe that this water, that this water poured, out poured out from many bottles, poured out from many bottles, poured into one bottle, poured into into one bottle. bottle. like the many streams of our lives, like the many streams of our lives, and the streams of our struggles, and the streams of our struggles, whether it be against racism, whether it be against racism, poverty, poverty, ecological devastation, ecological devastation, the war economy, the war economy, the false narrative of religious nationalism, the false narrative of religious nationalism, whatever the pain. Is. Whatever the pain is. is, the lack of health care, the lack of health care, the lack of living wages, the lack of living people wages, people being locked in cages, people being locked, locked in cages, human beings, human beings. Human beings. Resegregation of our schools. Resegregation of our schools. Hurting of our native brothers and sisters. Hurting of our native brothers and sisters. All those streams. All those streams are coming together. Are coming together and forming a mighty rushing, mighty rushing river. And forming a mighty rushing river of justice. Of justice. Right here. Right here. And right now. And right now. As others. As others. Form those streams. Form those streams. And form that rushing water. And form that rushing water. And God anointed it. And God. Anointed it. Let it, Let it be so now. Let it be so now. But we cannot come here. But we cannot come here. And not also. And not also. In the authority of love. In the authority of love. And justice. And justice. Condemn. Condemn. What is going on? What is going on? We condemn. We condemn the modern day slavery. The modern day slavery. We cast. We cast down, down the injustice. The injustice. We, condemn we condemn and call evil, and call evil and, unjust. and unjust the caging of people, the, caging of people. the making people drink from toilets, the, making people drink from toilets. the refusal to even give them a toothbrush. A refusal to even give them a toothbrush. It is condemned. It is condemned everywhere throughout the Holy Writ. Everywhere throughout the Holy Writ. The mistreatment of the poor. Mistreatment of the poor. Mistreatment of the Stranger. stranger. It is to mistreat. It is to mistreat the prophets of God. The prophets of God. The anointed of God. The anointed of God. The angels of God. The angels of God. You are holding angels in this place. You are holding angels in this place. But you will not hold them forever. But you will not hold them forever. We join them now. We join them now. And not only do we bring condemnation. And not only do we bring condemnation. But we bring hope. We bring hope. It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. America turn around. America repent. America stop. America change your way. So we pour out this water now. 
So we are out of this water now. And declare this place a sacred place. We, you would not let us touch them. You would not let us touch them with our hands. With our hands. So we touch them by the Spirit. So we touch them by the Spirit inside of your detention center. Inside of your detention center. And we call that which is not. And we call that which is not as though it were. As though it were. The gate shall open. The wall shall be torn down. Our brothers and sisters shall be free. We will have the strength to fight. We will have the strength. We do believe in the mighty rushing water. We do believe in the mighty rushing water. It is so. It is so. We are baptized afresh. We are baptized afresh. In the rivers of justice. In the rivers of justice. In the rivers of love. In the rivers of love. It is so. 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 Let us step back where everybody is and I'll speak with You'll recall that the other pagan ritual event Omar Suleiman participated in was from December 2018. I don't know if that was his first pagan ritual, but it definitely was not his last. And this time, one of those same LGBT priestesses from 2018 kept her hand on his shoulder as they recited the prayer together. This is what Omar Suleiman calls sunnah, apparently. This protest with Barber happened in July 2019. In his masjid speech recommending Barber, that happened in 2020. Balanced voices, voices like Reverend William Barber. So again, Omar Suleiman in 2019 knew exactly what he was inviting Muslims to participate in when he recommended Barber. I mean, I don't think I can add anything that I haven't said before. Or maybe we'll see some imams come out and try to defend Omar Suleiman by saying the Sahaba committed shirk too, as happened, you know, back when the first example of Omar Sulaiman with pagan rituals came out. But, you know, whatever. I'm not going to repeat all of the points that I have made in the past and all the points that really should have been obvious to anyone who has a basic understanding of Islam. There's no need to repeat all of those arguments. But one thing is worth noting, actually. Back when we released the video on this beachside pagan ritual, I mean, <laughs> How sad is it that there's so many pagan rituals, we have to like distinguish them. But back when we released the video on the beachside pagan ritual, Omar Suleiman allegedly apologized. It was a complete non-apology, of course. It was actually outrageous in many ways, the things he was saying in this so-called apology. But what's interesting is that initially Suleiman denied having participated in any rituals. And then when the footage of him participating in this ritual came out, he made the excuse with uh, this quote. He said, quote, I hadn't even recalled that happening because I did not see that as an act of worship, but an act as part of the protest, end quote. But obviously he has had a lot of experience with these water rituals after 2018. And in this one in 2019, it is so obviously a religious group prayer mentioning all kinds of kufr religious ideas. And the fact that this has happened multiple times with the same water pouring, this means that Omar Suleiman in 2020 was familiar with a kind of ritual of this nature because he had been in it multiple times. So how did Omar Suleiman in 2020, in this so-called apology, not recall himself participating in 2018, what he had to have known was a religious ritual, given his experience in 2019? It's quite a noodle scratcher, this one. At the end of the day, according to Suleiman's Sunnah Framework and Yaqeen Institute, allying with pro-LGBT groups and supporting LGBTQ rights is perfectly fine according to the Quran and Sunnah. There is no conflict. There is no problem with the Quran and Sunnah. So ultimately, in this podcast, when Omar Suleiman says we cannot support anything that opposes Quran and Sunnah, that's really not saying much at all, since he thinks, he actually believes that 
all of that allyship and all of that support that he and his friends have been doing for years, all of that does not oppose the Quran and Sunnah. Neither this clip nor the other four clips on YouTube where Suleiman tries to do this damage control with a bunch of convoluted wishy-washy fluff that only makes him look like he's dodging the issue. None of these clips do anything to counter or respond to the accurate criticism of mine all these years against Omar Suleiman. He thinks that it's not only Islamically valid, but Islamically praiseworthy to ally with pro-LGBT groups. And according to his institute, it's even fine to affirm and advocate many LGBT rights, including gay marriage. The thing that Omar Suleiman always whines about in these clips, by the way, is that, oh, we're ascribing to him beliefs that he doesn't actually have. This is a complete straw man. Actually, it's a typical straw man from compassionate imams. No one cares what your intentions are or what your private beliefs in the depths of your heart are. We are simply judging by the apparent, by what you have been putting out year after year as a supposed imam. We are critiquing you for your public statements, your public associations, your public support for Zanadiqa like Ilhan Omar and Linda Sarsour, your public so-called ijtihad to Islamically justify all the disgusting work you essentially do for the Democratic Party, all the public trash your institute puts out. That's the critique. And these four minute vague ambiguous videos where you get these softball questions, don't fool anyone. Talk is cheap when all your actions tell a different story. And by the way, we haven't scoured hours of video footage searching with a fine tooth comb trying to uncover obscure clips from the darkest corners of the internet. Just search in YouTube Yasser Qadi LGBT or Omar Soleiman LGBT. And all of these videos that we've clipped are on the top results. Most of these videos are actually up on Yasser Qadi's official channel. All it requires is just listening carefully to what these guys say, and any Muslim will realize how deviant and corrupt their message is. Now going back to the whole Iqna debacle, all someone like Omar Suleiman or Yasser Qadi have to do is call Iqna on the phone and say, look, if you invite Ilhan Omar, count me out. That's all they would have to say, but they never do that. I wonder why. I wonder if Omar Suleiman and Yasser Qadi want their own children and their own families to turn out like Ilhan Omar. That's a good question for them, actually. Maybe they do. Maybe they do want their sons and daughters and families to follow the example of Ilhan and dance in gay pride parades and condemn the Sharia. Yasser Qadi himself actually had no problem calling the Sharia bizarre and problematic in the past, so it's not actually that far-fetched. But if they don't want that for their children, then why are they okay with Ilhan Omar and Linda Sarsour and Keith Ellison being imposed on unsuspecting children and their families at these conventions and events that they speak at? The bottom line is that people like Yasser Qadi and Omar Suleiman have played a key role softening the religious masjid-going community to the Qawm Lut agenda and liberalization in general. Both Yasser Qadi and Omar Suleiman through his Yaqeen Institute have either softened up or actually pushed the Muslim community into reformism and the idea of reforming Islam for modern times. If you want to see the evidence of this reformism and how it's explicitly advocated by someone like Yasser Qadi, just watch Muslim skeptic videos or read our articles detailing the history of all of this. Legitimating Ilhan Omar and promoting her is actually a small piece of their overall crimes against the Ummah. Now, we could demand that Qadi and Suleiman clarify their views on Qawm Lut rights and tell Muslims that supporting such rights are categorically forbidden and in fact Muslims have a duty to oppose Fahisha politically or privately or morally or socially. We could demand that Qadi and Suleiman condemn their liberal activist friends and colleagues, and fully retract their past statements. We could demand that they condemn Ilhan Omar and tell Muslims to stop supporting her. We could demand all of that. But the truth is, what's the point? 
We have been telling them all this for years now, publicly and privately, and they have shown nothing but contempt and arrogance in response. So let this be their legacy. Yasser Qadi often likes to talk about his legacy, so let this be his legacy and the legacy of the Dawah Mafia and the compassionate, unfit Imams. Their legacy is that in a time of great fitna and the rise of liberalization and the rise of modern day Qomlut, they helped forward that agenda in the Muslim community and they put a religious veneer on it. And this has led to misguidance for countless Muslims, even non-Muslims, and it has even led to Ridda. And when they were corrected over and over and over again, they viciously attacked and boycotted their critics and arrogantly refused to change course. That is their legacy. And my final note, don't let these individuals lie and pretend to cover their past. Don't let them do this kind of historical revisionism of what they have promoted for years. Don't let anyone forget the massive amounts of damage that they've caused over the past decade liberalizing the Muslim community in America and trying to actually spread that liberalism to Muslims around the world. Alhamdulillah, all their statements are there publicly saved and recorded. And at any time, anyone can review these public statements and even make video compilations that document their treachery and their selling out. I encourage scholars, du'at, and other channels to do this work and hold these individuals accountable in an objective and fair way according to the standards of the Quran and Sunnah. And as for us at Muslim Skeptic, we're always happy to continue doing our work, inshallah. Please make du'a for us. In the course of making this video, Yaqeen announced that they're holding a webinar to address LGBTQ plus issues. Basically, Yaqeen is continuously doing damage control because of their long legacy of doing and saying the wrong thing on this and many other critically important topics. So we want to help them out for this webinar. Let's give them some criteria for success. If they want to actually help the community, Omar Suleiman has to clarify a few ahkam. First, there is the ruling on same-sex sexual behavior. Omar Suleiman has been clear on this in the past, that it is haram. So presumably he's going to repeat that and there is no controversy there. But if you notice, the flyer for this event says LGBTQ+. So we need to hear what is the ruling on the other letters. We need Omar Suleiman to tell us about the B, about the T, about the Q. How many genders are there? Is gender transition permissible? What about accommodating transgender in mosques? What about openly gay or transgender Muslims? Should the mosque be making accommodations specifically for them? Please explain what the Q is. What are queers? What does that mean? What is their status in Islam? We need to hear all this clearly from Omar Suleiman because his institute talks about LGBTQ plus with all those letters and he is allied with people that support all of those letters. And Yaqeen actually has three essays written by an openly queer Instagram influencer, believe it or not. And Yaqeen refuses to take those essays on their site down. So these issues need to be clarified fully. Secondly, what is the ruling on supporting LGBT rights? Omar Suleiman must make a clear and categorical statement that it is absolutely haram for Muslims to affirm or advocate any LGBT rights, full stop. None of this, we respect their rights, they should respect our rights. No, this is not acceptable. Muslims cannot acknowledge Qawm Lut rights and it would be haram for them to do so. This has to be said by Omar Suleiman. Furthermore, he must acknowledge that Yaqeen made a mistake in teaching Muslims the opposite of this for years and defending it for years. 
Basically, he has to publicly repudiate his Yaqeen director, Jonathan Brown, and admit, hey guys, we were wrong, Jonathan Brown was wrong, we made a mistake. This is absolutely incorrect and haram thing that we had on our site for over four years, and we refused to take it down even after we added a scholarly review board, which supposedly is about maintaining Islamic standards. Even with that review board, we didn't take our trash down. Omar Suleiman needs to publicly admit all of this. The third issue, allying with Qom Lut and pro-LGBT groups, Omar Suleiman needs to come clean. Don't tell us some nonsense like, we have no problem sitting with Christians and Jews, therefore we have no problem sitting with Qom Lut. No, don't give us the long, convoluted, incoherent mess about Sunnah framework, blah, 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 Sunnah activism, blah, blah, blah. We have seen what your Sunnah framework actually means and what it actually leads to. Khutawat is shaitan, the footsteps of shaitan. We've seen that already. We have seen you sit with Christians and Jews and Qom Lut and engage in all kinds of kufr and shirk, all in the name of poverty or migrants or whatever cause. We know exactly what your allyship is about, Omar Sulaiman, and you must come out and condemn such allyships and tell your audience that they're completely forbidden by Islam. And then you need to apologize for advocating this haram position and misappropriating the sunnah for years. The fourth issue, Omar must condemn these activists and politicians which he has closely worked with for years. He has to clearly state that Ilhan Omar in particular and Linda Sarsour in particular are publicly doing and advocating the haram and they should be rejected by the Muslim community for their haram. Omar Suleiman should then apologize for the major role he has played in platforming and partnering with these activists and their ilk in the past. Then, in the future, he should do what he should have been doing this whole time. He should condemn any organization, any Muslim group that platforms or promotes these figures and promise never to speak at events or conventions or conferences or panels where such fusaq are also platformed. These are the points Omar Suleiman himself needs to clarify. It's not enough for him to pass the buck to his co-speakers at the webinar and have them give their talking points. He is the face of Yaqeen. He has been central in spreading confusion, spreading all kinds of incorrect misguidance on Islam. Therefore, he is the one who must show accountability for his egregious mistakes. If any of these things are missing from this webinar, then it will be a failure and Yaqeen and Omar Suleiman should continue to get blasted for their role in normalizing fahisha and misguidance in the Ummah. But if Omar Suleiman does say all these things, that is a huge change. It will have a beneficial, positive impact as a first step in righting the wrongs and fixing the damage caused by his liberal activism over all these years. For those who are going to watch the webinar, keep these points in mind and watch very attentively. Listen closely. All of these problematic clips we've shown you in this video came from prior Yasser Qadi and Omar Suleiman speeches where they were attempting to clarify on these LGBT issues. And unfortunately, many Muslims praised those speeches and said, MashaAllah, the Shaykh is speaking the Haqq. In reality, they spoke some Haqq, but they mixed it with a mountain of batil. And that has confused countless Muslims. So most likely, I, I hope not, but most likely the same thing will happen with this webinar. No matter what is actually said, I'm sure that some people are going to be quick to say, MashaAllah, see, they have the right views. Alhamdulillah, they said the right thing. They spoke the haqq. Yeah, that's going to be the reaction of some people, but the rest of us need to watch carefully and make sure that the right things are actually said. Not more vagueness, not more ambiguity and confusion, mixing the haq with all kinds of batil. So please watch carefully and please make dua that Allah rectify all our affairs and that Allah protects us. Ameen.